You're listening to The Jacob Vaught Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Vaught. Here he is, Jacob Vaught. Of the Jacob Volk Show. I am the Jacob Volk. And you're not. You know what I'm going to start with. The Brooklyn Nets taking care of business against the Boston Celtics. Beating them in five games like I said they would. And clinching their second round matchup against the Milwaukee Bucks. That series will start on Saturday. And it is a 7.30 start. When you watch Nets games... You think to yourself, which member of the big three is going to step up? Game four was Durant and Irving. Harden took a little bit of a back seat. He still got his 23 points and 18 assists, but when Kevin Durant has 42 points and Kyrie Irving has 39 points, 23 points is nothing compared to that. So Harden said, you know what, it's my time. I'm going to step up here. I'm going to show that I can still score. I've taken on more of a distributor role with the Nets. I'm happy to do it, don't get me wrong, but watch this. Harden had a triple-double. 34 points, 10 rebounds, and 10 assists. He became only the second net to ever have a triple-double in the NBA playoffs. The other guy did it 10 times. Jason Kidd. For the first time since 2007, When the Nets beat the Toronto Raptors in the first round, only to then lose to the Cavaliers in the second round, the Nets won a playoff series at home. To have not won a playoff series at home in 14 years, I mean, that's tough. But this team is just built differently. When you have three players combine for 83 points, and in the game before, combine for 104 points, how do you beat this team? It takes Herculean efforts. Jason Tatum needed to go off and score 50 points for the Celtics to win. 40 wasn't enough. What's the one thing that everyone said about the Nets? Hey, we know they can score, but what about defense? Can they defend? Yes, they can. This series, the Nets have played well defensively. The Celtics only shot 28% from beyond the arc. The Nets' perimeter defense was really good. Did Kyrie Irving have some possessions where he drove you nuts? Yes. 
But I feel like that could have also been part of the game plan. We'll let Marcus Smart shoot. We'll let Romeo Langford shoot. We'll let Evan Fournier shoot. We just want to keep the ball out of Jason Tatum's hands and be in position to grab that rebound and push the pace. Harden and Durant were excellent defensively in this series. I mean, Harden was on another planet defensively in this series. That might be one of the best defensive performances you'll get in a series this year. Now, granted, simple defense, switch everything. If you see someone not named Jason Tatum shooting, don't try to force the ball out of his hands. But Harden did it incredibly well. Durant did it really well. Bruce Brown did it really well. You know, I don't want to see anyone say that the reason the Nets won this series was because Kemba Walker and Jalen Brown were out. Walker obviously missed the last two games and Jalen Brown missed the whole series with injuries. That's not why the Nets won. The Nets won because they were by far and away the better team. Did those injuries make it easier? Yeah, of course they did, but injuries are part of the game. Every team is dealing with injuries. The Nets are dealing with an injury. What's the Nets starting five been in these playoffs? Harden, Irving, Durant, Harris, Griffin. That means that their best player coming off the bench is Jeff Green. He's their sixth man. Have you seen Green recently? Because I haven't. I don't know if he's going to be back in time for game one of the Buck series. I'll tell you it's possible. We were initially told that the green injury would be reevaluated in 10 days. Green suffered the injury in game two. That took place a week ago yesterday. Ten days from that point is this coming Friday. So there is a chance that we could see green in game one. And the Nets will need him. They'll need all the help they can get. The Bucks are going to be really tough. I don't want to say that this series was a cakewalk, because it really wasn't, but you take a look at the final scores of all the games, the Nets won games 1, 2, 4, and 5 by double digits. The game they lost, game 3, they only lost by 6 points. I mean, game one was tough. That first half, the Nets played like garbage, but then they turned it on in the second half. They've done that all year. Game two was a blowout. Game three, the Nets played the Celtics tough, but Jason Tatum just went off. Game four, Kyrie and Durant went off. And game five, Harden went off. As far as playoff series go, the series that the Nets just had against the Celtics was an easy one. They're going to have their work cut out for them against the Bucks. A really, really good Bucks team. A team that the Nets can beat, don't get me wrong. Here's what gives me great confidence in the Nets, Okay. Go back to their first two games in May. May 2nd and May 4th in Milwaukee. The Nets lost the first game by three points. They lost the second game by six points. That's bad, right? No, it's not. Because James Harden didn't play in either one of those games. 
I think it's a fair bet to say that James Harden would be responsible for four more points on May 2nd and seven more points on May 4th. Look, Giannis will make Durant work. Drew Holiday will make James Harden work. I'm going to key in on Kyrie Irving. Whichever one of the big three isn't defended by either Giannis or Holiday, two excellent defenders, is going to need to go off. You'll see Joe Harris get some opportunities. Blake Griffin may get some opportunities. It's going to be a tough series. It's going to be a fun series. It's one that I do expect the Nets to win, though. I saw some people changing their picks after watching the Bucks destroy the Heat. They said, you know what? I had the Nets before, now Bucks in seven. Did you just watch the Nets destroy the Celtics? Okay, the Heat are better than the Celtics. I get that. But the Nets did win their series pretty convincingly. Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo, or Kevin Durant and James Harden. Who would you rather have? Your answer better be Durant and Harden. I think the Nets have a great, great, great shot in this series. If betting was legal in this state, I'd put some money down on the Nets. But there's some Celtics news to talk about also. This morning it was announced that Danny Ainge has retired from his position as Celtics president of basketball operations. And he'll be replaced by Brad Stevens. Stevens isn't going to be head coach and president, though. He is stepping down as head coach. He's just going to focus fully on the front office. So the Celtics are looking for a new head coach. Let's focus on Danny Ainge retiring first. Because after last night, I was totally prepared to come on this show and rip Danny Ainge. Because let's be clear. The Brooklyn Nets, I don't want to say they won the trade of Pearson Garnett. But it cements the notion that that trade didn't set the Nets back a lot. In the first playoff matchup between these two teams since the trade, the Nets destroy them in five games. Yes, the Celtics have made two Eastern Conference Finals appearances, but that's it. When you make that trade and you are given a dynasty, you've got to win... NBA titles. Let me ask you this. The Herschel Walker trade. The trade that gifted the Cowboys a dynasty. You think we'd look back on that trade as the heist that it was if not for the fact that the Cowboys won three Super Bowls in the 1990s? Picks are only good if you use them correctly. The Cowboys used them correctly. They got Emmitt Smith. They got Russell Maryland. They got Darren Woodson. And they got Kevin Smith. Because of those four guys, granted, Smith is at the bottom of the list, but he's still there. He was a good corner. Because of those guys that Jimmy Johnson picked, with the draft picks that he acquired in the Herschel Walker trade, the Cowboys became a dynasty. And we look back at that trade with our jaws on the floor. 
for a while, we look back at the Pierce and Garnett trade in the same way. Now, I don't think we can do that. This notion that the Nets need to win to exercise the demons of that trade, no, I disagree with that. Look at the trade in a bubble. The Nets are now going to the second round and have a great chance of going further, and the Boston Celtics are making golf reservations. Granted, the Nets' future after next season is murky because the big three are all free agents and God only knows what's going to happen. But the Celtics' future is equally as murky. Can the Boston Celtics put together a team that's capable of winning an NBA Finals with Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown on their roster? At this very moment, I don't think so. At one point in time, though, they could have. Go back and look at all the stars that were traded that the Celtics passed on. Jimmy Butler, Carmelo Anthony, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, and Anthony Davis. We'll never know for sure if the Celtics could have traded for all of those guys, but it's a fair bet to say that they could have traded for at least one of them without giving up Brown and Tatum. What was the one win-now move that Danny Ainge made after the Pierce and Garnett trade? Trading for Kyrie Irving. Where's Kyrie Irving now? Oh, yeah! He's a Brooklyn Net! The one win now move you made was for a guy who only spent two seasons with you. That's it. And then he went to the team that you made that trade with. A team that just beat you in the playoffs. It's impossible. To overstate how bad Danny Ainge was after that trade. Yes, he pulled off the coup of the century. Four first round picks for three aging players and DJ White. But what did he get the Celtics? Two Eastern Conference Finals appearances. That's not enough. If the Dallas Cowboys just made two NFC Championship game appearances, we're not looking at the Herschel Walker trade as the coup that we look at it as under the prism of the Cowboys' three Super Bowl wins in the 90s. Danny Ainge was gifted a dynasty. He blew it. He absolutely blew it. And now it's up to Brad Stevens to pick up the pieces. Look, I think Stevens will do a solid job He's an incredibly smart guy, okay? We know this. Came into the NBA out of Butler with a ton of fanfare. And I think it's fair to say that as of 24 hours ago, he was one of the 10 or 15 best coaches in the NBA. Did as good a job with the pieces that he was given as could be expected. 
The transition from head coach to president of basketball operations is tough. Make no mistake about it. It's two completely different animals. But I think Stevens can do it. As for who he's going to hire as his successor, I have no idea. Almost immediately, Chris Haynes of Yahoo Sports threw out Jason Kidd and Lloyd Pierce as possibilities. Jason Kidd, I could see. Even though he left an incredibly bad taste in my mouth with what he did to the Nets after his first year as head coach making the failed power play, forcing his way to the Bucks, He's done a good job of rehabbing his image. I think he'd welcome the opportunity to go back to the Atlantic Division and stick it to the Nets a little bit. Jason Kidd would make sense. Lloyd Pierce wouldn't. Seeing as though the Hawks are one win away from advancing to the second round with Nate McMillan as their head coach, the only conclusion that you can draw from that is that Lloyd Pierce was holding the Hawks back. For a Celtics team that needs to win in the playoffs kind of quickly, Lloyd Pierce is the last guy on earth you want. I saw Chauncey Billups' name mentioned. That would be really interesting. You gotta remember, Billups was actually drafted by the Celtics, but was traded to the Raptors because Rick Pitino didn't want to develop him. We've heard Billups be mentioned as being a head coaching candidate before. It wouldn't surprise me if he got that job. I thought of Kenny Atkinson. It is his birthday today, by the way. Happy birthday. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. If you're looking to win now in the playoffs, I don't think you want Atkinson. Speaking of the Nets, I heard Mike D'Antoni's name mentioned. He would make sense. Jacques Vaughn would make a little bit of sense, although I don't think that would be considered a sexy hire. I think he'd be behind the eight ball pretty quickly. Ime Udoka would make a ton of sense. I thought of a couple current assistant coaches for the Celtics. Jay Laranega, Jim's son, has been with the Celtics since 2012. And Jamie Young has been with the Celtics since 2011. The Celtics do like promoting from within. It's something that they've done throughout their history. And you gotta realize, with Brad Stevens calling the shots now, you gotta think there's a possibility that he could be partial to one of his assistants. Look, it's going to be interesting to see who the Celtics get. There's no question that that's an incredibly appealing job. You've got a solid core, a core that's capable of making the playoffs, just not making a lot of noise when you get there. It needs some work. And you gotta think that Brad Stevens will do the work. He saw what Danny Ainge did. He had a better view of it than anyone. And he experienced the mistakes firsthand. The Celtics are gonna be a very interesting team to watch. There's no question about that. Moving on now to... What was by far and away the best game of these playoffs so far. 
any game that happens tonight, tomorrow, and beyond is going to have a tough time being better than Trailblazers Nuggets. The game went into double overtime. Damian Lillard hit big shot after big shot after big shot. When it's game time, watch out. You know he's going to go off. He actually set the record yesterday for most three-pointers made in a single playoff game. Twelve. Despite Lillard's 55-point performance, the Blazers lost by seven. 147 to 140. But make no mistake about it, this game had everything you want. A huge comeback. The Blazers were down by 22 in the second quarter. Then they go on an epic, and I mean epic, 30 to 11 run to close out the quarter. You're down by 22. With 7 minutes and 44 seconds left in the second quarter. By the time halftime hit, you're only down by 3. The Nuggets just forgot how to play defense. You've got to force the ball Out of Damian Lillard's hands. For God's sake, if he's going off, make someone else kill you. Bad job by Mike Malone. An even worse job in not fouling Lillard late. The Nuggets were up by three with nine seconds left. Damian Lillard has the ball in his hands. You know he's going to shoot it. Do you know he's going to hit it? Obviously not. But you don't want to give him the opportunity. Michael Porter had every opportunity to foul Damian Lillard. Instead, he lets him shoot a step-back three, vintage James Harden. You can't let him do that. You've got to foul him. Let him hit the free throws. Play the foul game. You're up. Odds are you're going to win. You had every opportunity to land a death blow against the Trailblazers, you just didn't do it. That's a terrible job by the Denver Nuggets and Mike Malone. The game's in overtime. The Nuggets have a big lead. They're up by nine. With two minutes and 14 seconds left in the game. Once again, game time. He was responsible for the last 12 points that the Blazers scored in the first overtime. The Nuggets defense was nothing short of dreadful. And again, you don't foul. I don't understand it. You just saw Lillard hit a big three to send the game into overtime. Similar situation, you're up by three with about ten seconds left in overtime. You have the opportunity to win it. You don't need to go into a double overtime. Nope. Let's let Lillard shoot. I mean, in all fairness, it was good defense, but still, don't let him take the shot. You've got a foul. 
Yes, it's boring. Yes, some people think it violates the spirit of the game. But it's a good strategy. It works. The game went into double overtime. By then, the Lillard magic was over. He couldn't get any help from his teammates. No trailblazer, with the exception of Lillard, scored 20 points yesterday. The game went into double overtime. Norman Powell and C.J. McCollum both played 50 minutes. Robert Covington played 43 minutes. You've got to break 20. I mean, if you get one more point in either regulation or the first overtime, the Blazers win. Yusuf Nurkic had a bad game. He fouled out really early. He played just 24 minutes. By the end of the game, only Lillard and Norman Powell were still eligible to play out of everyone that started the game for the Blazers. This is something that's played Damian Lillard his whole career. He just doesn't have a great supporting cast. He has a good supporting cast. It's a supporting cast that can get to the playoffs and maybe can win a series or two, but that's it. That's all it is. This isn't Terry Stotts' fault. I've heard rumors that he could go if the Blazers lose this series. I like Stotts. I think he's a good coach. The reality is the Blazers just don't have a roster capable of winning the whole thing. It's fair to wonder if it's in the Blazers' best interests to blow things up. Treat everyone except Lillard. Try to rejigger this roster so that it can go on a big run. Moving on now to Lakers Suns. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. This game was a joke. It was over in the first half. You can't score just 10 points in the second quarter and expect to win. At halftime, the Suns were up 66-36. to Now, some people are going to say this loss is on LeBron. And I understand their point. He is the best player on the team, and he's got to step up and win an incredibly important Game 5. Game 5s are always important. But this loss is more on Dennis Schroeder. This loss is more on Wesley Matthews, Andre Drummond, Markeith Morris, KCP. The supporting cast. LeBron did what you want him to do. He shot 9 for 19 from the field, 6 for 10 from beyond the arc. He had 24 points. But the supporting cast was just non-existent. Everyone except Kyle Kuzma and Taylor Horton Tucker no-showed. Oh, well then LeBron needs to make his teammates better, blah, blah, blah. It's kind of tough to do that when they're not hitting shots. I mean, I'll say this. LeBron can't have a first half where he only has seven points. 17 of LeBron's 24 points came in the third quarter with the game already out of reach. I get that. It wasn't a great performance by LeBron by any stretch. He tried to take the game over in the third quarter. Too little too late, though. I mean, I'm not putting this loss solely on LeBron. I'm just not. I'm putting it on the supporting cast of the Lakers. Without Anthony Davis, that team is dreadful. I see why the Lakers had to win the play-in game. 
to get into the playoffs. Does this loss irreparably harm LeBron's legacy? The answer is no. It's tough that this is the first time in LeBron's career that he's lost consecutive first-round games. I mean, the Lakers are better than the Suns. At least on paper, they are. I picked the Lakers to win this series. Instead, the Suns won a game that they needed to win. They did a great job of exploiting the Davis injury. It's kind of tough to view a two-seed beating a seven-seed as an upset, but I feel like that's what we're on the verge of here. I didn't see many people picking the Suns in this series. In breaking news, and this comes from Jeff Goodman of Stadium, Mike Krzyzewski is going to retire... After this coming season. Also according to Goodman John Shire. A former Blue Devil and current assistant coach for Duke. Is the leading candidate to replace Coach K. After the year that Duke had. Can you blame Coach K for wanting to retire? I mean the guy has nothing left to accomplish. He's the best coach in college basketball history. I'll tell you, this could motivate Duke. Win a title for Coach K in his last year? How great would that be? It's a new era of college basketball in North Carolina. Out with Roy Williams, in with Hubert Davis. Next year, out with Mike Krzyzewski. In with John Shire, or Shayer. I don't know how he pronounces it. Very, very interesting. I'll say that. But now it's time to preview tonight's four NBA games. I'll start with Wizards Sixers. If the Wizards are going to win this game, they need to follow the Suns blueprint. You saw what the Suns did against the Lakers. They drive the lane... Got some easy buckets. When the Lakers decided to contest, they kicked it out for wide open shots. Anthony Davis and Joel Embiid are similar. They're both excellent interior defenders. You've got to exploit that injury like the Suns exploited the Davis injury. And yes, Joel Embiid is out for this game. He was diagnosed with a small meniscus tear. If there's a game six, God only knows if he's going to play, but Embiid is out tonight. So I'm looking at guys like Ben Simmons and Tobias Harris to really step up here. Simmons only had five field goal tries. In game four, Tobias Harris shot just 33% from the field in game four. I mean, that's not going to work. The Sixers did a bad job of compensating for the Embiid injury. That's to be expected when it happens mid-game. It's tough to adjust mid-game when something like that happens. Now that they've had time to adjust, I think you'll see Simmons step up. You'll see Harris step up. You'll see guys like Curry and Green step up. I think the Sixers will win it here. Moving on now to Hawks-Knicks. A game that could devolve into a riot. Clint Capella was talking smack yesterday. I don't know if that's the best move when you have a rowdy MSG crowd to deal with. It's going to be interesting to see how the fans behave. I'll say that. If the Hawks are going to win, they need to play through Trey Young. We all know that. I know I'm not breaking 
anything new, but I can't make stuff up. Young has been by far and away the best player in this series. He's got to keep that up. If the Knicks are going to win, Julius Randle needs to step up, okay? It's just that simple. R.J. Barrett, too. You can't have Derrick Rose as the best player on the Knicks. This is an MVP, Derrick Rose. This is sixth man, Derrick Rose. Where's the all-star, Julius Randle? Where's the young star, R.J. Barrett? Those guys have been non-existent all series. I praised the Knicks before this series started. I thought they'd destroy the Hawks. But these guys are wilting under the bright lights. I love it as a Knicks hater, but if you're a fan of the Knicks, you've got to be tearing your hair out right now. I mean, I know that no one expected the Knicks to be here, so that lessens the impact of this series loss. Assuming the Knicks end up losing. But still... The Knicks were the better team. They haven't played like it. I'll say that the Knicks force a game six. But to win game six in Atlanta is going to be tough. Moving on now to Grizzlies Jazz. There is no chance whatsoever that the Memphis Grizzlies win this game. Okay, it's just that simple. The Grizzlies gave their fans false hope by winning game one. Donovan Mitchell was out. That's why the Grizzlies won. With Mitchell in the lineup, yes, the Grizzlies have played the Jazz tough, but the Jazz have won. The Grizzlies have nothing to be ashamed of here. They played well. They played the Grizzlies really competitively. But they just have no chance here. There's no way that they're going to win this game. The Jazz will end the series here. I'm sorry. I wish I could give you more, but I just can't. The last NBA game to talk about is Mavericks Clippers. This game all comes down to Luka Doncic. If Doncic is affected by his neck injury as much as he was in Game 4, the Clippers will win. If the massages work, if the ice packs work, then the Mavericks have a great chance of winning. It's all on Luka, one of my favorite players in the NBA to watch. The Clippers destroyed the Mavericks in Game 4. They won by 25 points. Doncic was non-existent. For the first time in the playoffs, he had less than 20 points. He shot just 9 for 24 from the field, 1 for 7 from beyond the arc. It's all on Luka. I'll say this, though. Even... If the massages and the ice packs work, Kawhi Leonard and Paul George will make his life very tough. Doncic will be at less than 100%, so I'll take Kawhi Leonard and Paul George over a less than 100% Luka. Give me the Clippers. All right, now I'll give you some NHL Vault talk. And I'll start by recapping Lightning Hurricanes. The Lightning have really put the Hurricanes behind the eight ball here by taking the first two games in Carolina. I mean, the Hurricanes played well in this game. They were by far and away the better team. It's not even close. They had 32 shots on net. You know how many the Lightning had? 15. The Hurricanes more than doubled up the Lightning in shots on goal. 
But it didn't matter. Andre Vasilevsky stood on his head. Alex Nedeljkovic had by far and away his worst game of the playoffs. I mean, that first goal, that's just put the puck on net and see what happens. You can't allow that to go in. I understand that Ned never saw it. Okay, I get that. He was screened by two guys. But still, that's a shot from the point. It didn't have a lot of velocity on it. That's one that Nedeljkovic really should have stopped. Now, in all fairness to Ned, the second goal was more Brady Shea's fault. He had the opportunity to get the puck away from Sorelli, and he just couldn't do it. Shea has had a bad series so far. He's really got to step it up. It's just that simple. I'm not going to blame Ned for that goal as much as I am Brady Shea. The Hurricanes did score a goal with their goalie pulled. It was a nice pass out front to Svechnikov, but by then, it was just too little, too late. You knew that Vasilevsky wasn't going to give up another goal. This was a deflating loss for the Hurricanes. They were the better team in this game. I don't see how the Hurricanes come back in this series, I'll say that. But now it's time to preview Canadians Jets. A series that I'm going to have a tough time getting into. I mean, I'll be honest with you. This is a three seed going up against a four seed. Two teams that I didn't see a lot of in the regular season. I feel like I'm every man here in America. I'm going to have a tough time getting excited about these games. If the Habs are going to win this series, they've got to get out to an early lead. And I don't mean in individual games. I mean in the series itself. You're not going to come back from 3-1 down twice. It was impressive that you came back once. Don't get me wrong. It's one of the best moments in recent Habs history. But you're not going to do it twice. Steal a game in Winnipeg. It's just that simple. As for the Jets, they need to keep up their great defensive play. They did a great job on McDavid and Dreisaitl. The Habs have no one close to those guys. I'm looking at guys like Neil Pionk. Tucker Poolman, Josh Morrissey, etc., etc., to really step up again. The Jets are not a great offensive team. They're not an awful offensive team, but they're not great. They found a formula that works for them defensively, shutting down McDavid and Dreisaitl. Let's see if they can duplicate it against the Habs. This is the only playoff series I can make a pick for. I like that the Jets have home ice advantage. I think they're going to have fans in the stands for the first time since last March. So give me the Jets in six. Moving on now to Golden Knights Avalanche. If the Golden Knights are going to win, they need to start Marc-Andre Fleury. It was a stupid decision to start Robin Lehner. You put yourself immediately behind the eight ball when you do that. I know that you didn't expect Lehner to give up seven goals, but you've got to ride with Fleury. Okay, I get that he's tired. I get that he's exhausted. He just got through a tough seven-game series. You know what? You can rest in the offseason. There are no off days in the playoffs. Suck it up and push through it. It's just that simple. 
As for the avalanche, keep up the strong pressure, keep up the great forecheck, your power play was outstanding. Keep that up. The Avalanche don't need to change anything if they're going to win this game. But I don't think they're going to. I think Flurry's going to be motivated. This series will turn into a best three out of five, which bodes well for Pete DeBoer because both teams will be in the same boat. So give me the Golden Knights. Until tomorrow, I am Jacob Volk saying that an umpire is like a woman. He makes quick decisions, never reverses them, and doesn't think you're safe when you're out.